Well, hello. Welcome to English 3327. This is a survey of British literature from the beginnings down to 1800. And this is a course which actually extends over two semesters, though you're not required to take both semesters of the course in order to get credit for just one semester. But uh, the story picks up next semester with around 1800 and comes down to the present time so that people who watch the first half or take the first half for credit very frequently will choose to take the second half as well so that they can get uh, the rest of the story. So this class, let me say a little bit about the format of this class for those of you who are not familiar with this kind of a course. This class is a distance education class. And right now, those of you who are here present with me, to whom I'm speaking directly, uh, are in a studio classroom, as you no doubt have become aware since you've come in the room. And we are being videotaped. And the classes will be put on television and will also be available on DVD and eventually on a university server for uh, people simply to log on to the server and connect to these classes. So a number of you are taking this class in a form which is known as distance education. But you should be aware that right now I'm not simply speaking to the, the air out here, uh, as you can see there in that shot, I uh, have a live class here with me. And they are going to be interacting with me along the way because we try to make these classes as much like regular classes as we possibly can. Now, of course, we do have some additional features that come in because this is televised. And we can take advantage of certain forms of technology that are not available in every one of our regular classrooms. And we'll see that as we go along. But for now, let me simply say that this class, uh, which some of you are taking at a distance, as we say, uh, watching it on television or uh, accessing it on DVD or through the university server, and some of you right here with me right now during this term, that uh, this course is an advanced English class which also fulfills a number of requirements. For those of you who are English majors or minors, and there may be a few of those here in the class or out there in, uh, in the distance education versions of it. For those of you who are English majors or minors, this fulfills one of your requirements for early English literature or simply as an English literature elective. And for those of you who are not English majors or minors, this course counts as a core requirement, a core humanities requirement. And uh, so you, too, will be getting credit for it, not simply as an elective, but also to fulfill part of your, your core requirements. So having said all of that, let me talk a little bit about the course and about what we're going to be doing in the course. Since this is a survey of British literature, we are going to be beginning at the beginning. And this means that we will be going all the way back, perhaps even today, uh, to begin with, all the way back to the Anglo-Saxons when they first came to England in the middle, or perhaps a little bit earlier than that, of the fifth century of our era. And I'll be filling in the details of this kind of historical context in just a little while. And we will see then the beginnings of a formation of a British culture. I'm calling it deliberately British rather than specifically English, because we're also talking about the kind of culture which developed throughout the British Isles. And this, of course, obviously includes the English in our usual sense of the term English. But it also includes the Welsh, the Scots, the Irish, and various other subgroups of these, which we will be talking about as we go along. And together, we are talking about something which is really quite complex and for which I'm using the general term British literature. Because from time to time, we will be making references to things that were going on uh, at the same time as 
something happening in England, we'll be talking about, well, what was happening in Scotland at that time? What was happening in Ireland at that time? What was happening in Wales at that time? What was happening in continental Europe during that period? Because we're dealing here with an international culture at a time really before we had nation states in our modern sense of nation states. We had people who were generally referred to, uh, and often historians nowadays will generally refer to them by the, by the Greek term ethnoi. And the term ethnoi meant something a little bit different than we mean by ethnic or ethnicity. It meant a people who saw themselves as having enough in common to see themselves as a distinct people distinct from, say, other peoples with whom they came into contact. And uh, we'll talk more about that kind of social organization as we go along, because it very much affects, especially the earlier developments of English literature. And so, naturally enough, we're going to be getting into the masterpieces of English and more generally British literature uh, in this course. and. In the beginning, we'll be looking at things like a selection, a very famous selection from Bede, sometimes known as the Venerable Bede, who is a first, the first really, really great historian of the early Middle Ages, and certainly the first great historian of England, who tells the story of one Cadman, who was the, not exactly the first English poet, but certainly the first English poet to incorporate the new Mediterranean culture coming from the South, especially being brought by Christian missionaries, into his traditional English poetic forms. And we'll be talking about that in more detail, so don't worry about that if that sounds a little complicated and perhaps even obscure right now. And then we will be moving into some of the early Anglo-Saxon or Old English poems, followed by our moving into Beowulf. And of course, you know you're not going to get away from a course like this without having the great opportunity to read Beowulf. Uh, it reminds me of a line in Woody Allen's uh, Annie Hall, when he's talking to his then girlfriend, played by Diane Keaton, and she's thinking of going back to school and taking some classes, and he says, okay, okay, finally, you know, okay, go back, take some classes, take some literature classes if you want to, but just don't take a course in which they teach Beowulf. And of course, everybody in the audience, at least all the old English majors, you know, are rolling around laughing at that point. But it's kind of an in-joke for people who uh, take classes like this. In any event, we will be reading Beowulf. And we will be reading Beowulf and studying Beowulf in the now famous Seamus Haney translation. Seamus Haney is not only the foremost Irish poet of the 20th century and now the 21st century uh, after Yeats, but uh, he also is arguably the foremost poet writing in the English language, period, uh, anywhere in the English-speaking world in our time. And Seamus Haney has done a very famous translation of Beowulf, and that's the one we're going to be concentrating on here. Now, you may, if you wish, consult other translations, and there are some very, very good ones out there, which uh, leads me to seemingly digress for just a moment, but as you will discover, I never really digress because I'm always looking for yet another point here. Um, the textbook that we're going to be using is the Norton Anthology of English Literature, Volume 1. And the Norton Anthology of English Literature, Volume 1, in its new edition, has the Seamus Haney translation. However, it is not necessary for you to have the current edition if you have uh, one of the earlier editions that will have almost all of the text that we're going to be studying, but the translation of Beowulf will be a different translation. It's the prose translation by Talbot Donaldson, but that too is a very, very fine translation, and it's something that you certainly could follow if you would prefer to do so. 
So uh, we go on after Beowulf into the study of the great Middle English literature, uh, particularly Chaucer, and we'll spend a fair amount of time on Chaucer. And while it is true that you're going to be looking at Chaucer in the Middle English, which is going to seem very uh, off-putting at first and very uh, strange looking to you and strange sounding, as a matter of fact, uh, once we get into it and I will be guiding you along the way, Students generally find it really interesting to look at Chaucer in the original. And it doesn't take very long to get to a point where you can actually read it for yourselves. So we'll be reading Chaucer as one of the great poets in the English language. Uh, selections from the Canterbury Tales, starting with the general prologue and then a couple of the Canterbury Tales. And then we will be moving through the later Middle Ages, talking about the development of Arthurian romance, which was not simply uh, something that took place in England, but took place all over Europe and even beyond. As we will be discussing, Arthurian romance was the first really great international literature of the period that we are studying. And uh, there are Arthurian romances in every language of Europe and even beyond. There's even, I ran into a few years ago, there's even an Arthurian romance in Hebrew, uh, which was done in the 12th, 13th centuries. And uh, so, you know, this stuff is all over the place. And it's what everybody got excited about. If they could read the romances themselves, great. But remember that we're talking about a period in which most people were not literate. But they would nevertheless experience these stories because they'd have them read aloud in public gatherings so that they could hear uh, the kinds of, of literary works that we are going to be studying. And then we will move into the beginnings of what traditionally is called the Renaissance, though many cultural historians now prefer to refer to this period as the early modern period, for reasons that I'll get into more when we get to it. The term Renaissance was originally a value term, which was not only used to promote the positive values of what was claimed to be the Renaissance of European culture in the 15th and 16th and 17th centuries, but it was also intended to denigrate, to put down the culture that immediately had preceded it. And uh, that's one of the reasons why historians in our time are a little uneasy about using those kinds of value terms. But we'll get more into that as we go along. And uh, this will, of course, get us into the great English writers of that whole period, beginning in the 16th century, the period dominated by the Tudor monarchy, uh, beginning with uh, Henry VII and ending with Elizabeth I who died in 1603. So uh, certainly covering the 16th century and even a little bit more than just that. And so we'll have people like Sidney and Spencer and of course Shakespeare. And so uh, we will be reading not only some of Shakespeare's sonnets and talking about those in relation to the sonnets of some of the other poets of the period, but we will also in particular be studying Hamlet. And some of you will have noticed when you went to the bookstore that uh, I had ordered the Norton Anthology of English Literature Volume 1 for this class. But that does not contain a version of Hamlet. The reason why is that I'm trying to keep your costs down. The least expensive texts of Hamlet that I could have gotten just as freestanding texts would have been 12 to $15. Whereas you can go, and I'm not trying to give advertisements to anybody in particular, but you can go to half price books or to a public library or almost anywhere uh, where books are collected and sold and find a, uh, an inexpensive copy of Hamlet. Uh, you may even have one at home, you know, in an, in an anthology of, of one kind or another. So if you have trouble, let me know. Though I can't imagine that anybody really is going to have trouble. But if you do have trouble, you live in an outlying area where maybe somebody's already checked the book out of the library, 
I'm sure that we can make arrangements to make sure that you get a copy and at the lowest possible cost to you. So you will be required to study Hamlet, even though it is not in the Big Fatty Anthology. And at some point during the course, preferably around the time that we are conducting our discussion of Hamlet here in class, I'm going to ask you to view a film production of Hamlet. Now you can choose which one you want to view. That's entirely up to you. But I will ask you to view some production of Hamlet. Now, we have quite a number of different versions of Hamlet here in the University of Houston Library, and you can check those out and, uh, and view them uh, at no cost to you, because obviously you're students and you've already paid whatever necessary fees would cover this. And uh, so that's one way that you can view a production, or more than one production of Hamlet, if you want to compare uh, two or three different versions. And also, Hamlet is something which is widely available in, uh, oh, again, I'm not trying to make money for anybody, but you know what I'm talking about, the, the video rental stores. They all have copies of Hamlet. Uh, you can get it off the internet. I mean, it's very, very easy to come by. And the reason for this is that I have a particular project I'm going to have you undertake, which is to view a version of Hamlet and look at that version of Hamlet, that production of Hamlet, in light of the questions that we're going to be discussing about Hamlet here in class. And so you can only really fulfill that assignment by viewing a production of the play. Did you have a question? Yeah, don't forget to press. But let me just uh, say this, because she's the first one who's going to be doing this now. Uh, when you ask a question or make a comment, you'll see that there's a little device in the middle of the desk in front of you, those of you who are live with me. Uh, press, I think it's a green button, isn't it? Um, no, it's just, just push. Just something that says push? OK. So just push that while you're talking, OK? Uh, and that way, people who are not here physically present with us will be able to hear your question. And you might also think about your participation in this class in the following way. You're asking questions on their behalf. So if you're bewildered by something, or you're uncertain about something, or you think that I haven't been sufficiently clear in the explanation of something, raise a question about it, because if, if you're confused, then there are going to be a lot of folks out there who are also confused. So uh, once again, you will be doing them a favor by asking a question. So having said all of that, please go ahead and ask your question. Um, you can find the full text of Hamlet also online. Just search it, and there should be like all sorts. You could print it out and read it. Oh, great. Yeah, that's, actually, that's a very good point. You can probably just Google. Yeah, and find a, uh, a text of Hamlet online and, and even a printable text if you, uh, if you want to. Uh, that's true of an increasing number of literary masterpieces that they are being made available in non-copyrighted form. And therefore, you know, it's perfectly within the law for you to go ahead and make copies if you wish, uh, which would even be a less expensive way of doing things. Thank you very much for pointing that out. And uh, there also will be a question on the final examination, which I'm going to be talking about in a little while, um, about Hamlet. And so once again, you will need to not only have read Hamlet, but also to have thoughtfully viewed a, uh, a production of Hamlet in order to fulfill that particular requirement on the final examination. It's not scary at all. It's actually quite easy. Uh, once we get into this, you're going to see how it works. So then, after we get through with Shakespeare, we're going to be moving into the 17th century. And we will be talking, uh, first of all, about the, uh, the great authorized version of the Bible of 1611. Authorized by whom? Authorized by the Church of England in 1611, the so-called King James Version. I say so-called King James Version because King James had nothing to do with it. He just happened to be the reigning monarch of England at the time that the Church of England produced 
this authorized version of the Bible. And so it was dedicated to him. And if you pick up a King James Bible today, uh, you can see the first page is a, is a letter dedicating this translation of the Bible to him. And we'll be looking at that as a great literary masterpiece. This is not a course in theology. It's not a course in the Bible. It's not a course in religion as such. Uh, but the, uh, the King James Bible is one of our great literary masterpieces. And we'll be looking at that as a translation in the context of looking at some other great translations of the Bible into English that were done during the same time and which in part influenced the translators of the King James Bible. And we'll be talking about that. It's a very interesting story, by the way. And then we will be going into the major poets of the 17th century, particularly the earlier 17th century. Uh, John Donne comes immediately to mind as one of the great poets of that period. Very, very interesting, very, very complex figure. And of course, John Milton, one of the very, very great poets in the English language. And we will be reading a very substantial part of his masterpiece, Paradise Lost. After which, we will and I will have set this up for you by virtue of talking about history uh, as we're going along, you will see that a great historical shift takes place at that time in English history. And uh, you know, whole new forms of government are developing and so on and so on. And uh, so you move in the later 17th century into a whole new era, as it were, of the development of English culture. And of course, at that time, remember, people were beginning to migrate out of England and Ireland and Scotland and Wales, and they were coming over here. And of course, the kind of culture that they were developing over here was originally the culture that they had learned and absorbed back home. And so there are all kinds of interesting connections there. And as we're going along, while this is not a course in American literature, I'm going to be making references to things that were happening in the Americas. And uh, what certain American writers were doing with some of the things that they encountered in English literature and in English culture generally. So, uh, on into the later 17th century with writers like John Dryden and then the earlier part of the 18th century, uh, writers such as Alexander Pope and Jonathan Swift. Everybody at least has some familiarity with Gulliver's Travels. You've at least heard about Gulliver's Travels if you haven't actually read some of it. And uh, we'll be reading a part of that. And then we will be closing out our discussion of the 18th century by reading some of the poems of the latter part of the 18th century, which signal from our perspective, given the advantage of hindsight, the end of an era in a way, but also some sense of something new which is coming, but it hasn't really yet fully developed. And from a cultural point of view, that is going to be the great cultural movement of the late 18th and early 19th centuries, which we know as Romanticism. Over here in America, it tended to be called Transcendentalism. In German philosophy, it tended to be called Idealism. But these are more or less synonymous terms for the same general cultural movement. And that's where we will be ending this course. But it's also the point at which we will be beginning the next course. And once again, don't be alarmed if you're about to graduate. Uh, you're not required to take the second half of, of this British literature survey in order to get credit for this one. Uh, but for those of you who are continuing, you may want to go on and, uh, and hear the rest of the story and engage with it. And uh, there are various people who teach that, but I, for one, will be teaching that uh, next term. So, okay, having said all of the above, this is simply a kind of general overview of the content of the course. 
So now, Scott, if we can go to the uh, PowerPoint. Let me, aha, see, we have the official introduction here. And uh, so I've already gone through the first of the course requirements, the readings assigned on the syllabus for class discussion. And believe it or not, while I am doing all or most of the talking today, I don't have to do all or most of the talking every class. And I welcome your comments, your questions, your observations. You do not have to agree with me on every point. And I welcome your disagreements. And we can have uh, an interesting dialogue about uh, any agreements or disagreements we may have along the way. We also are going to have weekly journals, which I'm going to tell you about just in just a moment a term paper, and then a final examination. All of these, by the way, are explained in great detail in a version of the course description and syllabus, which will be available online. And also, you can download, if you wish, and also, if you have difficulty finding out where to go to get it, simply call or email the University of Houston Office of Distance Education. That's distance education. And they can give you further directions on uh, how to access that. Those of you who are here with me uh, today, uh, I have printed copies already for you. If you didn't get one, if you came in a little bit late, uh, they're available in the back of the room. And you can certainly get one when we uh, leave today. So let me go over these various items. The readings, as I've already mentioned, is a, this is a survey of major works of British literature from Anglo-Saxon times to the end of the 18th century. We have two texts, the Norton Anthology of English Literature. And be sure you get volume one because volume two is for the second half of this course. So be sure you get volume one. And a full text of Hamlet in whatever version or by whatever means you do so. OK? Weekly journals. Let me say a few words about this. At the end of each week, I ask students to write out their personal responses to the text discussed during that week, or any questions that have come up in the class discussion. These are your personal responses. There's no way to get this wrong, because after all, your, the responses are your personal responses. They're not my responses. They're not somebody else's responses. They're your personal responses. About one to two pages each week. And uh, what does that mean? Well, it usually means for most students a fair sized paragraph or two. But you know, a page, maybe a little bit over a page each week. This is the only way that I can get feedback from you. And that's one of the reasons why I ask you to do that. Because then I find out what you're thinking about You know, as we're going through the material in the course. And then, if we can go back to the screen, please, Scott, uh, you will email these to the assistant instructor. And uh, the assistant instructor's name and email address is in that printed description of the uh, course description and syllabus. The only reason why I hesitate to, uh, to put that out on the air right now is that some people are going to be watching this in a future semester when that may be a different email address. You know, and then I wouldn't be able to go back and correct it. So uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. And I'll give you my email address, by the way, for any of you who would like to contact me directly. Though the assistant uh, instructor for the course is the one who actually keeps the records for students, the, the different folders for students and student assignments turned in and so forth. So uh, the assistant instructor is a good person to 
uh, to know about and to get in contact with when you're uh, keeping up with assignments or if you have any problem with keeping up assignments. But my email address is <coughs> J, J for John, J McNamara, just my name, J M C N A M A R A at uh dot edu. See, it's pretty easy. My name at uh University of Houston dot edu educational institution. So it's J McNamara at uh dot edu. And if you have any trouble with accessing any materials or getting in touch with the assistant instructor or anything else which is a problem for you with the course, whether you are in the class here physically present with me during this term or uh, if you're a distance education student in another term, uh, you know, please feel free to email me. Okay. Uh, by the way, if you get behind, people always ask me this question. Oh my God, you know, I, I just had a baby right in the middle of the course. Or, uh, you know, we had some kind of health problem in the family. Or, uh, you know, God knows anything can happen. After all, life does intervene at times. That's perfectly okay. If you get behind with the journals, just catch up, okay? Just catch up. It's never too late to catch up. Just catch up, all right? Okay, secondly, the term paper. The term paper obviously is going to be a major factor in the course. The term paper topic is for you to select a British woman writer, not an American. You know, people always say, well, can I use da 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 whoever it may be, uh, anywhere from the Middle Ages to 1800. I cannot tell you how many people will say to me, well, gee, can I use Jane Austen? No, Jane Austen was not uh, involved in an active literary career until after 1800. You can use Jane Austen next semester, but not this semester. Um, can I use so-and-so who happens to be an American writer? Uh, well, no. Uh, this is a course in British literature. You can uh, write about, you know, American writers in the American literature course. So. Uh, so you will pick one. We have quite a number of them represented in the anthology, by the way. And those will give you lots of leads to lots of other women writers from the general time period that we are studying in the course. And then you will write a paper on her and her work from the perspective of what we now call canon formation. Some of you may know what that means, but most people probably don't. So let me say a few words about that. Um, I'm going to go back to the, thank you. This is what we sometimes call the problem of the canon or the problem of canon formation. This is by analogy with the Bible. You know, there was a very long period among the, uh, the ancient Jews during which uh, the rabbis debated for literally centuries about what would be the authentic books of the Hebrew Bible, or what Christians call the Old Testament. And that was by no means straightforward or clear. And so the Hebrew Bible underwent a long process of being developed, and a number of decisions had to be made about what would be included in the official text and what would not be included in the official text, or what was called the canon. In other words, which texts are or are not authentic documents of the primary sacred tradition, and thus, by definition, canonical. And you may have heard this term elsewhere. You know, the canonical books of the Bible and the non-canonical books of the Bible and that sort of thing. 
Uh, for example, Protestant editions of the Bible will typically have one whole section, which are the canonical texts, and then they will have another section uh, which is entitled Apocrypha or non-canonical texts. Those, by the way, tend to be included in Catholic editions of the Bible, Roman Catholic uh, editions of the Bible, uh, as canonical texts. But nevertheless, I'm not going to get off into those kinds of squabbles, except to look at the bottom of the screen now, the questions of authority. Who gets to decide and on what basis? Well, in ancient times, it was the rabbis, right? I mean, after all, they were the, the ones who had the sacred responsibility for not only maintaining the texts, but also spreading the word about the texts and teaching the texts. And they were the ones who were the scholars and who eventually made the decisions about what got included and what did not get included in the canon of the Hebrew Bible. But we also ask, on what basis do people make those decisions? This is not a course in biblical scholarship, but if it were, we would get off into a lot of very interesting questions at this point about how decisions get made about the authority of this text over against the authority of that text and so forth. Because you're not simply talking about a whole book of the Bible, say, whether it goes in or doesn't go in. You're also talking about different manuscript traditions, so you can have quite different versions of the same work. You know, let me jump way, way, way ahead uh, to Shakespeare. We have five different versions of Hamlet. We have three different versions of Romeo and Juliet. On what basis do the scholars make authoritative judgments about what the text is actually going to be? That's a very, very interesting question. And so also did they face this in ancient times in dealing with the the books of the Bible and the different versions thereof. The same thing was true in Christian tradition. In the very earliest days of Christianity, the four Gospels that Christians now consider to be canonical were not the only Gospels around. There were other Gospels. There were other epistles. There were other narratives which claimed authority in early Christian tradition. So who made the decisions, and on what basis, and with what authority? And that leads to some very, very interesting questions, by the way, which are of very great interest, by the way, right now to biblical scholars who are raising serious questions about some of those issues. But in any event, uh, let's see where this leads us in the study of literature. OK, once again, we come back to the question of canon formation. Remember what I just said about the Bible. Who decides and on what basis? So what does the literary canon, I put quotes around that because here we're really talking in a more or less figurative way. Obviously this is not the same thing as making decisions about the Bible. What we now consider the literary canon consists of those authors and works that are given stature as major or important. By what? Well, for one thing, inclusion in prestigious collections such as our textbook, the Norton Anthology of English Literature. What could be more canonical than that? This is the most widely used collection of English literature throughout the English-speaking world. So that if you were to go to another English-speaking country, if you weren't studying from this text, your teacher and others would know about this text. It has enormous prestige. So who gets in and who doesn't get in? And on what basis? Now, we're not going to have huge arguments about whether we include Chaucer or Shakespeare or Milton. 
But then, you know, we have all kinds of interesting questions. How do we arrive at a consensus among people who are regarded as authorities? And regarded by whom as authorities? They're usually academics, by the way. They're generally people like me, academic scholars who uh, form the professorate, uh, who by consensus will agree that certain writers are important enough to include in courses like the one that we are currently engaging in. Okay? So, let's see. The paper is going to consist of three parts. The first part is going to be setting up the context in which you consider the life and times of your writer in about two pages. By the way, these suggestions of page lengths are not absolute. Your total pages will come to somewhere between eight and ten printed double-spaced pages. And then you will have an analysis of one of your writer's works. Could be a novel, could be a play, could be a collection of poems. And then thirdly, you will give your now informed judgment, your informed judgment based on your having read this woman's works and studied her in the context of her times. You will provide your informed judgment of her place among the major writers in British literature up to 1800. And this is your conclusion of you know, roughly a page. Okay? Are there any questions about what I've just said? Okay, we can go away from the screen now just for a moment. Thank you. Um, so basically what it is, is you're looking at an anthology like this in which certain writers are given a great deal of prominence. They're not only included, but they're given a great deal of prominence. Now there was a time, this time now is fortunately passed, but there was a time in which you could go back to earlier editions of the Norton Anthology or similar anthologies of English literature and you would look high and you would look low trying to find women writers being represented. We now have quite a lot of women writers being represented in large part because we've had quite a number of scholars, most of them women scholars, though some men scholars as well, who have gone out and actually recovered the literature of many earlier women who simply got ignored or got forgotten along the way. And so now what we're doing is we are restoring them to the place that they deserve within the so-called canon of English literature. So that's what you're going to be considering. You read somebody like Offer Bain. Offer Bain wrote a very famous novel, which by the way is in our anthology, called Orinoco, and uh, which has all kinds of interesting uh, things going on in it, by the way. So, uh, but I'm not going to get off into that right now today. But Offer Bain has gradually not only been included in discussions of this kind, but her literary stock, as it were, has progressively risen and risen and risen and risen. Let me give you an example which might be more familiar to most of you of the sort of thing that I'm talking about. In the second half of this course, which re begins roughly around 1800 or thereabouts, and then comes down to the present time with actual living writers, contemporaries of ours, uh, it used to be that there were very, 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 very few women writers represented in the anthologies, either English literature or American literature. I remember in, when I was in graduate school, which is not that 
long ago, believe it or not. But when I was in graduate school, there was a book that every graduate student was expected to read at one point or another, and it was a history of the English novel. And in that history of the English novel, of course, you had all the greats included, you know, there were Fielding and Defoe and Richardson and Thackeray and Dickens and on and on and on and on. And oh yes, there was a page and a half devoted to Virginia Woolf, who was described as an interesting minor novelist. Well, that's totally changed. We now regard Virginia Woolf as one of the major writers, not only of the 20th century, but one of the major writers of English literature, period, of any time, right? These are the kinds of things that will shift around. In American literature, there was a very long time in which we not only underrepresented women, but we also underrepresented uh, writers of color. People who were African American, people who were uh, Hispanic or of Hispanic origins, and so on and so on and so on. Now, American Indians, another obvious example. You might have some brief little thing at the very beginning, you know, which would be a kind of token inclusion of an American Indian song or something like that. Now you look at the anthologies, and they are filled with American Indians, uh, African American writers, uh, Hispanic writers, as well as obviously many, many women writers whether those women be uh, of some particular ethnicity or, or, you know, what we here in Texas at any rate call people Anglo, whatever an Anglo is, by the way. Um, I can say that because my name is McNamara, you know, and you say Anglo, oh, okay. But you know what I mean in terms of our usage here. Uh, so in any event, um, times have changed. And if you were taking this course 20 years ago, or 30 years ago, or 50 years ago, you would have been studying a different set of writers, at least to a large extent. Or the emphases might have shifted. So, uh, that's part of what we're dealing with here. You pick your writer. You read up on her. You look at her work, and then you come up with your considered informed judgment about what her place is or ought to be in the so-called canon of major or important writers in English. Okay? Fair game uh, throughout the British Isles. The, uh, if you want to take an English woman, that's fine. If you want to take somebody from Ireland or Scotland or Wales, that's fine but confine yourself at least to the British Isles, okay? If you have any questions about, you know, does this woman fit or that woman fit or not fit and so forth in terms of the assignment, just ask me or ask the assistant instructor. Okay, any questions about anything that I've said? All right, well, let's go on to the question of documentation, if we can go back to the screen, please. Um, all sources will have to be documented. Let's see. Uh, so all sources will have to be documented. You're going to have to use some outside sources, aren't you? How are you going to find out about somebody in the 17th century? I mean, if you can afford to travel to London and look in the archives at original materials, fine, have at it. Uh, you're still going to have to document those. But more than likely, you're going to be looking at some secondary sources of the period in which you can find out information about your writer. Document those sources. Okay? And then you know I'm going to have to put this in. Taking the wording, information, or ideas from an outside source, including the internet, because people always think, oh my god, the internet is something different. Well, it's not something different from this point of view. 
without citing the source constitutes plagiarism. It's so simple. I don't know why anybody ever plagiarizes. It's so simple. All you do is stick a footnote in. This is where I got this from. If it's somebody else's words, you put quotation marks around it and then put a footnote reference to it. It's all that simple. Now, are you afraid that you're going to get marked down because you have relied too heavily on outside sources? Oh, no. English teachers and history teachers and so forth get thrills and chills when they see footnotes and documentation and so forth. It's so easy. You use somebody else's ideas or information or their words. Just document it. It's that easy. Now, while for English students, that is to say English majors and minors, uh, MLA form is the preferred method for documentation. I know that some of you are probably psychology majors or business majors or whatever. We will accept any reasonable and clear form of documentation. Does that include the APA form, American Psychological Association form? Yes, it does. So just go ahead and, uh, and document something in, in a clear and readable form. OK? And we're getting close to being out of time for this particular meeting, so uh, I'm going to defer talking about the final examination until after we come back from our break. But let me just say one more thing in our remaining minute or so about the, uh, the term paper. What you're going to be leading up to is you're going to be building a case for the conclusion that you arrive at. The place of your writer in the collection of major writers in British literature. This is now an informed judgment because you have actually studied this writer in the context of her time. You know about her. You know probably more about her than I do because you've read a lot and read a lot recently. And because you have very, very carefully looked at and analyzed her work. So you are now prepared to do a truly informed judgment of her and of her place in our literature. So let's take a break, and we'll be back in 10 minutes. <laughs>